Section six of Mr. Fortune's Practice. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. Mr. Fortune's Practice by H. C. Bailey. Case four The Magic Stone. A nightingale began to sing in the limes. Mr. Fortune smiled through his cigar smoke at the moon and slid lower into his chair. In the silver light his garden was a wonderland. He could see fairies dancing on the lawn. The fine odor of the cigar was glorified by the mingled fragrance of the night, the spicy scent of the lime flowers borne on a wind which came from the river over Meadow Sweet and hay. The music of the nightingale was heard through the soft murmur of the weir stream. The head of the Criminal Investigation Department was arguing that the case of the town clerk of Barchester offered an example of the abuse of the simple poisons in married life. Mr. Reginald Fortune, though his chief adviser, said no word. The head of the Criminal Investigation Department came at last to an end. That's the case, then. He stood up and knocked over his coffee cup. A tinkling clatter, profound silence, and then only the murmur of the water. The nightingale was gone. Well, Fortune? Mr. Fortune sighed and raised himself. Dear me, Lomas, he said sadly, why don't you find something to do? The Honorable Sidney Lomas suffered from a sense of wrong, and said so. It was a difficult and complex case, and had given him much anxiety, and he wanted Fortune's advice, and she did him in all right, said Reggie Fortune succinctly, and you'll never find a jury to hang her. Why don't you bring me something interesting? Lomas then complained of him, pointing out that a policeman's life was not a happy one, and that he did not arrange or even choose the crimes of his country. Interesting, good gad! Do you suppose I'm interested in this female bluebeard? I know my job's not interesting. Work's work. And eggs is eggs. You have no soul, Lomas. Reggie Fortune stood up. Come and have a drink. He led the way from the dim veranda into his study and switched on the light. Now that, he pointed to a pale purple fluid, that is a romantic liqueur. It feels just like a ghost story. I brought it back from the Pyrenees. Whiskey, said Lomas morosely. My dear chap, are we downhearted? You should go to Scotland Yard, Fortune. Lomas clung to his grievance. Perhaps you would find it interesting. What do you think they brought me this afternoon? Some poor devil had an epileptic fit in the British Museum. Well, well, Reggie Fortune sipped his purple liqueur. The British Museum has made me feel queer, but not epileptic. On the contrary, sprightly fellow, this is an our story. Go on, Lomas. That's all, Lomas snapped. Interesting, isn't it? Then why Scotland Yard? You're not in hospital for nervous diseases. Or are you, Lomas? I wonder said Lomas bitterly. Why Scotland Yard? Just so why? Because they've lost an infernal pebble in the fray. And will I find it for them, please? Most interesting case. Reggie Fortune took another cigar and composed himself for comfort. Begin at the beginning, he advised, and relate all facts without passion or recrimination. There are no facts, confound you. It was in the ethnological gallery of the British Museum, where nobody ever goes. Some fellow did go and had a fit. He broke one of the glass cases in his convulsions. They picked him up, and he came round. He was very apologetic, left them a fiver to pay for the glass and an address in New York. He was American, doing Europe, and just off to France with his family. When they looked over the case afterwards, they found one of the stones in it was gone. The epaulette couldn't have taken it, poor devil. Anybody who was in the gallery might have pocketed it in the confusion. 
most likely a child the thing is only a pebble with some paint on it a pundit from the museum came to me with his hair on end and wanted me to sift london for it i asked him what it was worth and he couldn't tell me only an anthropologist would want the thing he said it seems an acquired taste i haven't acquired it i told him this was my busy day Resi fortune smiled benignly but this is art he said this is a learning lomas have you cabled new york have i lomas stopped his whisky on the way to his mouth no fortune i have not cabled new york nor have i sent for the military the british museum is still without a garrison well you know this gentleman with the fit may be a collector oh lord no it was a real fit no deception they had a doctor to him reggie fortune was much affected there speaks to the great heart of the people the doctor always knows i love your simple faith lomas it cheers me but i'm a doctor myself my dear chap has no one ever murmured into the innocence of scotland yard the fit can be fight i dare say i am credulous said lomas but i draw the line somewhere if you ask me to believe that a fellow shammed epilepsy cut himself and spent a fiver to pick up a pebble i draw it there that's the worst of credulity it always sceptical in the wrong places what was this pebble like lomas reached for a writing pad and drew the likeness of a fat cigar upon which parallel to each other were two zigzag lines a greenish bit of stone with those marks in red that's the museum man's description if it had been old which it isn't it would have been a galecole and if it had come from australia which it didn't it would have been a choo-choo something churinga that's the word the pendant from the museum said it came from borneo they don't know what the marks mean but the thing is a sort of mascot in borneo a high-class insurance policy the fellow who holds it can't die so the simple bornese don't part with these pebbles easily there isn't another known in europe that's where it hurts the museum pundit he says it's priceless i told him marbles were selling thirty a penny nice round marbles all colours yes <laughs> you have no soul lomas i dare say i'm busy with <laughs> toctic spouses reggie said reproachfully green was it green quartz i suppose or perhaps jade with a pattern oxide of iron and i expect some child has swapped it for a green apple lomas dear mr fortune expostulated this is romance ten thousand years ago the cave men in france painted these patterns on stones and still in borneo those men making them for magic big magic a charm against death and some brought lad comes down to bloomsbury and throws a fit to steal one my hat he's the heir of all the ages i could bear to meet this epaulette i couldn't said lomas i have to meet quite enough of the weak-minded officially but reggie fortune was deaf to satire a magic stone he murmured happily uh, take the case by all means said lomas i'm glad i've brought you something that really interests you let me know when you find the pebble and announcing that he had a day's work to do on the morrow he went with an air of injury to bed it was an enemy parenthesis, a k c after a long and vain cross-examination in parenthesis, who said that mr fortune has a larger mass of useless knowledge than any man in england mr fortune has been heard to explain his eminence in the application of science to crime by explaining that he knows nothing thoroughly but a little of everything thus preserving an open mind this may account for his instant conviction that there was something for him in the matter of the magic stone or will you prefer to believe with superintendent bell that he has some singular faculty for feeling other men's minds at work a sort of sixth sense this is mystical and no one is less of a mystic than reggie fortune to the extreme discomfort of lomas he filled the time which their car took in reaching london with a lecture on the case he found that three explanations were possible 
the stone might have been stolen by someone who believed in its magical powers or by someone who coveted it for a collection or by someone who meant to sell it to a collector why why stop lomas yawned it might have been snapped by a kleptomaniac or an ostrich or a lunatic or perhaps some chap who wanted to crack a nut or a winkle does one crack winkles reggie went on seriously he thought it unlikely that the thing was stolen as a charm oh don't lose heart said lomas why not put it down to a fray from borneo the original owner comes over in his war paint to claim the long-lost magic stone Millet runs a muck in museum that would go well in the papers very plausible too compare the mysterious indians who are always hunting down their temple jewels in novels lomas you have a frugal mind of course some fellow might want for an amulet it's not only savages who believe in charms how many men carry a mascot through the war but your epileptic friend with the new york address don't suggest the simple faith i suspect a collector well i believe anything of collectors lomas admitted they collect heads in borneo don't they i know a fellow who collects shoes scalps or stamps or press cuttings it is all very sad i want you to cable to new york and verify this epilept uh, which i do not think i am going to look about for him here my dear fortune lomas sat up and put up an eyeglass to examine him are you well this is zeal but what exactly are you looking for that's what i want to find out said reggie and having left lomas at scotland yard made a round of calls it is believed that there is no class or trade from bargees to bishops in which reggie fortune has not friends the first he sought was a dealer in exotic curiosities from him not without diplomatic suppression of the truth mr fortune made sure that magic stones from borneo were nothing accounted of in the trade seldom seen and never sought it was obvious that the subject did not interest his dealer who could not tell where mr borneo would find such a thing old demetrius jacob was as likely a man as any queer name said mr fortune queer fish he was informed syrian you know with a bit of greek a lot of small stuff goes his way mr fortune filed demetrius jacob for reference and visited another friend a wholesale draper whose real interest in life was his collection of objects of savage art a still more diplomatic economy of the truth brought out the fact that the draper did not possess a magic stone of borneo and would do and pay a good deal to obtain one he was excited by the mere thought and reggie fortune watching him as he expanded on the theme of magic stones said to himself yes old thing a collector is a nigger in this woodpile the draper returning to the cold reality mourned that his collection lacked this treasure and cheered up again as the thought that nobody else had it nobody said reggie fortune really the draper was annoyed well i know tether down hasn't and he has the best collection in england of course with his money he can do anything reggie fortune neatly diverting the conversation to harmless subjects consulted his encyclopedic memory about old tetherdown lord tetherdown was a little gentleman of middle age reputed by connoisseurs to be the shabbiest in london he inherited great wealth and used it by living like a hermit and amassing an anthropological collection that afternoon saw reggie fortune knocking at a little house in the back street of mayfair the door was opened by an old woman in an overall lord tetherdown was not at home reggie fortune exhibited a great surprise really but i counted on seeing him can you tell me when he'll be back no i can't he's away it appeared to reggie that she was ill at ease away he repeated oh that's absurd when did he go he was off last night really but didn't he say when he'd be back no he didn't young man it's amazing i don't know what call you have to be amazed neither she cried i'll count it on saying him to die reggie explained i'd better come in and write a note 
the old woman did not seem to think so but she let him in and took him to a little room reggie fortune caught his breath for the place was ineffably musty it was also very full there was hardly space for both him and the woman cabinets lined the walls and in the corners in between the cabinets on top on the mantel the window-sill were multitudes of queer things a large and diabolical mask of red feathers towered above him and he turned from it to see a row of glittering little skulls made of rock crystal and lapis lazuli and carved with hideous realism on the door hung a cloak made of many-coloured bird skins and a necklace of human teeth with the green image of a demon as pendant a golden dragon with crystal eyes gaped on the sideboard over the whisky decanter reggie showed no surprise he slid into a chair by the table and looked at the old woman i don't know what you want that you can't say she grumbled unlocked the desk and put before him one sheet of paper one envelope pen and ink well it's about a curio reggie smiled up at her the good lord knows we've got enough of them she cried that's what took him away now reggie showed no interest and naturally while he went on writing that mr fortune was anxious to consult lord tetherdown on a matter of anthropology she went on talking he learned that it was a gentleman coming about a curio who took lord tetherdown away the night before and she made it plain that she thought little of gentlemen who came about curios didn't he say when he'd be back reggie asked as he stood up to go not a word i tell you well that's strange strange is it it's plain you don't know the master young man he'd go to the end of the kingdom for his pretties i hope he hasn't gone as far as that said reggie he saw as he turned the corner of the street that she was still looking after him she knows more than she says he told himself Oh, she's more rattled than she'll let on. He went to Scotland Yard. Lomas was pleased to see him. And how do you like marbles, Fortune? He said genially. An intellectual game, I'm told. The glass ones are the trumps now, Bell says. I'm afraid you're old-fashioned. Stone isn't used by the best people. Breaking upon this merry persiflage, said Reggie. Have you heard from New York? new york is silent probably stunned by your searching question but the american embassy speaks where's that report bell superintendent bell with an apologetic smile for he always liked mr fortune read out james l breton is a well-known and opulent citizen now travelling in europe for his health present address not known for his health mark you lomas added yes uh, there is some good intelligence work in this business but not in scotland yard he is very harsh with us bill i fear he has had a bad day the marbles ran badly for him my dear fortune i always told you there was nothing in it eh, you did said reggie grimly i'll forgive you but i won't promise to forget do you know lord tetherden the little rag-bag who collects rags and bones he has been a joke this ten years lord tetherdown is a very wealthy man said superintendent bell with respect yes he's gone now lomas stemming your chitty wit apply your mind to this yesterday morning a rare specimen was stolen from british museum yesterday evening lord tetherdown who collects such things who hasn't got that particular thing and would pay through the nose to get it was called on by a man about a curio lord tetherdown went out and vanished my dear fellow loomis put up his eyeglass i admire your imagination but what is it you want me to believe that tetherdown arranged for this accursed stone to be stolen i doubt that said reggie thoughtfully so do i he is a meek shy little man well then did the thief try to sell it to tetherdown why should that make tetherdown run away it uh, might decoy him away lomas stared at him apparently trying to believe that he was real my dear fellow he protested oh my dear fellow this is fantastic 
why should any one suddenly decoy little tether down he never made an enemy he would have nothing on him to steal it's an old joke that he don't carry the worth of a shilling he has lived in that hovel with his two old fogies of servants for years and sometimes he goes off mysteriously and the fellows in his club only notice that he has been away when he blows in again you're a born policeman lomas reggie sighed you're so commonplace quite quite said lomas heartily now tell me you've been to tetherdown's place did his servants say they were surprised he had gone off the old dame said he often went off on a sudden reggie admitted and lomas laughed well what about it you won't do anything my dear fortune i'm only a policeman as you say i can't act without some reason oh my aunt said reggie reasons good night sleep sound in comfortable moments since he has been heard to confess that lomas was perfectly right that there was nothing which the police could have done but he is apt to diverge into an argument that policemen are creatures whose function in the world is to shut the stable door after the horse is stolen a pet theory of his he went to the most solemn of his clubs and having soothed his feelings with muffins turned up lord tetherdown in the peerage the house of tetherdown took little space john william bishop coppet was the seventh baron but his ancestors were not distinguished and the family was dwindling john william lord tetherton had no male kin alive but his heir who was his half-brother the hon george bishop coppet the hon george seemed from his clubs to be a sportsman mr fortune meditated on his way home he called upon the hon george whose taste in dwellings and servants was different from his half-brothers mr coppet had a flat in a vast new and gorgeous block his door was opened by a young man who used a good tailor and was very wide awake but mr coppet like lord tetherdown was not at home his man looking more knowing than ever did not think it would be of any use to call again oh no sir mr coppet was not out of town he would certainly be back that night but parenthesis, something like a wink flinkered on the young man's face and parenthesis, too late to see any one if the gentleman would ring up in the morning not too early reggie fortune said that it didn't much matter he went off to dine with her whom he describes as his friskier sister the one who married a bishop it made him sleep sound thus the case of the magic stone was left to ferment for some fifteen hours for which mr fortune has been heard to blame himself and the conjugal bliss of bishops over a deviled soul at breakfast nature demanded piquant food his mind again became active he rang for his car sam his admiral's chauffeur was told that he preferred to drive himself which is always in him a sign of mental excitement can't we work sir sam asked anxiously for he holds that only on salisbury plain should mr fortune be allowed to drive mr fortune shook his head and Sam swallowed, and they came down upon Oxford Street like the wolf on the fold. The big car was inserted, a camel into an eye of a needle, into the alleyway where Lord Tetherdown's house lurks. Again the old woman in the overall was brought to the door. She recognized Reggie Fortune, and liked him less than ever. "'There's no answer,' she cried. "'The master's not back.' "'Really?' "'You heard what I said. He's not let you know when he's been coming back.' no he hasn't nor have i no call to tell you if he had you and your curios the door slammed reggie went back to his car when it stopped again in a shabby street by covent garden sam allowed himself to cough this one protest from first to last a devoted fellow reggie fortune surveyed the shop of demetrius jacob which displayed in its dirty window shelves sparsely covered with bad imitations of old pewter reggie frowned at it looked at the name again and went in the place was like a lumber room he saw nothing but damaged furniture which had never been good and little of that until he found out that the dusty thing on which he was standing was an exquisite chinese carpet nobody was in the shop nobody came though the opening door had rung a bell 
He made it ring again, and still had to wait. Then there swept through the place a woman, a big woman, and handsome in her dark oriental way. She did not see Reggie. She was too hurried or too angry, if her flesh and her frown were anger. She banged the door and was gone. Reggie rapped on a rickety desk. After a moment, an old man shuffled into the shop, made something like a salam, and said, You want, yes? Not so old after all, Reggie decided in a second glance. He shuffled because his slippers were falling off. He was bent because he cringed. His yellow face was keen and healthy, and his eyes bright under black brows. But certainly a queer figure in that tight frock coat, which came nearly to his heels, and his stiff green skull cap. Mr. Jacob, Reggie said. I am the Matres Jacob, he pronounced it in the Greek way. Well, I'm interested in savage religions and cults, you know, and I'm told you are the man for me. Mr. Jacob again made a salaam. What I'm after is just now is charms and amulets. He paused and suddenly rapped out. Have you got anything from Borneo? Demetrius Jacob showed no surprise or any other emotion. Borneo? Oh, yes, I think, he smiled. Beautiful things. He shuffled to a cupboard and brought out a tray which contained two skulls and a necklace of human teeth. Reggie Fortune was supercilious. He demanded amulets, stone amulets, in particular a stone amulet like a cigar with zigzag painting. Demetrius Jacob shook his head. I not have him, he said, sadly. Not for Borneo. Our beautiful Gaelic Coleris from France, yes, and Russia. But not the East. I never see him from the East, but in the museum. Reggie Fortune went away thinking that it took a clever fellow to be as guileless as that. The car plunged through Piccadilly again to the flat of the Honorable George Coppet. Mr. Coppet's man received him with a smile which was almost a leer. I'll see, sir, he took Reggie's card. I'm afraid Mr. Coppet's particularly busy. As Reggie was ushered in, he heard a bell ring, and a woman's voice high and angry, Oh, yes, I will go, but I do not believe you, not one word. A door was flung open, and across the hall swept a big woman from Demetrius Jacob's shop. Reggie looked into the crown of his hat. She stopped short and stared hard at him. Neither she did not recognize him or did not care who he was. She hurried on, and the door banged behind her. The Honorable George Coppet was a little man who walked like a bird. Damn it, damn it, he piped, jumping about. What the devil are you at, Brown? He stared at Mr. Fortune, and Brown gave him Mr. Fortune's card. Hello, I don't know you, do I? I'm in the devil of a hurry. I think you'd better see me, Mr. Coppet, said Reggie. Mr. Coppet swore again and bade him come in. Mr. Coppet gave himself some whiskey. I say, women are the devil, he said as he wiped his mouth. Have one? He nodded at the catter. Now, well, what's your trouble, Mr. Mr. Fortune? I am anxious to have some news of Lord Terradown. <laughs> well, why don't you ask him? Mr. Coppet laughed. He got to be found. Well, <laughs> gone off again, has he? Lord, he's always had. My dear chap, he's simply potty about his curios. I don't know the first thing about them, but it beats me how a fellow can fall for that old junk. One of the best and all that, don't you know? But it's a mania with him. He's always running off after some queer bit of tripe. When do you expect him back? Such me, Mr. Coppet laughed. My dear chap, he doesn't tell me his little game. Old Martha might know. She doesn't. Mr. Coppet laughed again. He was always a close old thing. Just pushes off, don't you know, on any old scent and after a bit he blows in again. Then you don't know when you'll see him again, Reggie said slowly. Give you my word, I don't, Mr. Copper cried. Sorry, sorry. So am I, said Reggie. Good morning, Mr. Coppet. Mr. Copper did not try to keep him, but he was hardly beyond the outer door of the flat when he heard Mr. Coppet say, Hello, hello. He turned. The door was still shut. Mr. Coppet was using the telephone. He heard, Millfield, double three, something, and could not hear anything more. Millfield, as you know, is a quite middle-class suburb. Mr. Fortune went downstairs pensively. Pensively he was still when he entered Scotland Yard and sought Lomas's room. Well, how goes the quest for the holy stone? Lomas put up his eyeglass. 
my dear Fortune, you're the Knight of the Rueful Countenance." "You're confused, Lomas. Don't do it," Reggie complained. "You're not subtle at Scotland Yard, but, hang it, you might be clear. What can we do for you?" "One of your lot's cigars?" Reggie mumbled, and took it. "Yes. What can you do, I wonder?" He looked at Lomas with a baleful eye. "Who lives at Millfield?" Speaking more precisely, who lives at Mayfield double three something? Lomas suggested that it was a large order. It is, Reggie agreed gloomily. It is a nasty large order. And he described his morning's work. There you are. The further you go, the queer. Quite, quite, Lomas nodded. But what's your theory, Fortune? The walking hypothesis is that there's dirty work doing when a magic stone gets stolen and a man who wants the magic stone vanishes the same day, which is confirmed when a female connected with a chap who knows all about magic stones has found Colleguin with the vanished man's heir, and full support when that heir, being well, runs to telephone to the chase shades of Millfield, the last place for sporting blood like him to keep his pals. I ask you, who lives at Millfield, double three something. Loma shifted his paper. George Coppett stands to gain by Tenderdown's death, of course, he said. And the only man, so far as we know. But he's not badly off. He's well known. There's never been anything against him. Why should he suddenly plan to do away with his brother? All your story might be explained in a dozen ways. There's not an ounce of evidence, Fortune. You lock your evidence after the murder. I know that. My God, Lomas, I'm afraid. My dear fellow, Lomas was startled. This isn't like you. Oh, many thanks. I don't lock like men dying, that's all. Professional prejudice. I'm a doctor, you see. What a devil are we talking for? Who lives at Millfield double three something? We might get at it. Lomas said doubtfully, and rang for Superintendent Bell, "'But it's the needle in the bundle of hay, and if Tetherdown was to be murdered, it's done by now.' "'Yes, that's comforting,' said Mr. Fortune. Superintendent Bell brought a list of subscribers to the Millfield Exchange, and then looked over the names of those in the 3,400. Most were shopkeepers and ruled out. "'George Copper didn't buy his fish in Millfield,' said Reggie Fortune. Over the doctors, he hesitated. "'You think it's some fellow in your own trade?' Loma smiled. "'Well, there's nothing like leather.' "'Brown rig,' Regime Fortune muttered. "'I know him. Three, three, four, eight. Dr. Jordan, The Ferns, Chatham Park Road. Was a medical directory?' Three, three, four, eight. Dr. Jordan is not in the medical directory.' Ring up the divisional inspector and ask him what he knows about Dr. Jordan. There was nothing, Superintendent Bell announced, known against Dr. Jordan. He had been at the fern some time. He didn't practice. He was said to take in private patients. Come on, said Reggie Fortune, and took the superintendent's arm. My dear Fortune, Lomas protested, this is a bow at a venture. We can't act, you know. Bell can't appear. Bell's coming to be a policeman and appear when it's all over. I'm going in to Dr. Jordan, who isn't on the register. And I don't like it, Lomas. Bell shall stay outside, and if I don't come out again, well, then you'll have evidence, Lomas. Neither Reggie Fortune nor his chauffeur knew the way about in Millfield. They sat together, and Mr. Fortune, with a map of London, exhorted Sam at the wheel, and behind them Superintendent Bell held tight and thought of his sins. The car came by many streets of little drab houses to a road in which the houses were large and detached, houses which had been rural villas when Victoria was queen. "'Now go easy,' Reggie Fortune said. "'Chatham Park Road, Bell, quiet and respectable as a silent tomb. My God, look at that! Stop, Sam!' What startled him was a hospital nurse on a doorstep. "'Who is she, sir?' Bell asked. "'She's Demetrius Jacob's friend and George Coppett's friend, and now she's Dr. Jordan's friend and in nurse's rig. Keep the call back here. Don't frighten them.' He jumped out and hurried on to the ferns. 
I don't like it, young fellow, and that's a fact, said Bell, and Sam nodded. The woman had been let in. Mr. Fortune stood a moment surveying the house, which was as closely curtained as all the rest, and, like them, stood back with a curving drive to the door. He rang the bell, had no answer, rang again, knocked, and knocked more loudly. It sounded thunderous in the heavy quiet of the Chatham Park Road. At last the door is opened by a man, a lanky, powerful fellow who scowled at Mr. Fortune and said, We ain't deaf. I have been kept waiting, said Reggie. Dr. Jordan, please. Not at home. Oh, I think so. Dr. Jordan will see me. Don't see anyone but by appointment. Dr. Jordan will see me. Go and tell him so. The door was shut in his face. After a moment or two he began knocking again. It was made plain to all the Chatham Park Road that something was happening at the ferns, and here and there a curtain fluttered. Superintendent Bell got out of the car. You stay here, son, he said. Don't stop the engine. But before he reached the house, the door was opened, and Reggie Fortune saw a sleek man who smiled with all his teeth. So sorry you have been waiting, he purred. I am Dr. Jordan's secretary. What can I do for you? Dr. Jordan will see me. Oh, no, I'm afraid not. Dr. Jordan's not at home. Why say so, said Reggie wearily. Dr. Jordan, please. You had better tell me your business, sir. Haven't you guessed, Lord Tetherdown? Lord who? said the sleek man without a check. I don't know anything about Lord Tetherdown. But then you're only Dr. Jordan's secretary, Reggie murmured. Something of respect was to be seen in the pale eyes that studied him, and after a long stare, I'll see what I can do. Come in, sir. What's your name? He thrust his head forward like an animal snapping, but still he smiled. Fortune, Reginald Fortune. This way... The sleek man led him down a bare hall, and showed him into a room at the back. Do sit down, Mr. Fortune, but I'm afraid you won't see Dr. Jordan. He slid out. Reggie heard the key turn in the lock. He glanced at the window. It was barred. Quite so, said Reggie. Now how long will Bell wait? He took his stand so that he would be behind the door if it were opened, and listened. There was a scurry of feet and some other sound. The feet fell silent. The other sound became a steady tapping. Good God, are they nailing him down? He muttered, took up a chair and dashed it at the lock again and again. As he broke out, he heard the beat of a motor engine. Superintendent Bell, drawing near, saw a car with two men up, come out of the coach house of the ferns. He ran into the road and stood in its way. It drove straight at him, gathering speed. He made a jump for the footboard, and, being a heavy man, missed. The car shot by. The respectability of Chatham Park Road then heard such a stream of swearing as had never flowed that way. For Sam has a mother's love for his best car, but he was heroic. He swung its long body out across the road, swearing, but nevertheless. The fugitive from the ferns took a chance which was no chance. Their car mounted the pavement, hit a gatepost, and crashed. Superintendent Bell arrived to find Sam backing his own car to the curb while he looked complacently at its shining sides. No a scratch, praise God, he said. Superintendent Bell pulled up. You are a wonder you are, he said, and gazed at the ruins. The smashed car was on its side in a jumble of twisted iron and bricks. The driver was underneath. They could not move him. There were reasons why that did not matter to him. He's got ears, said Sam. Why's the other? There were two of them. The other lay half hidden in a laurel hedge. He had been flung out. He had broken the railings with his head. He had broken the stone below. But his head was a gruesome shape. In the hall of the ferns, Reggie Fortune stood still to listen. The muffled tapping was the only sound in the house. It came from below. He went down dark stairs into the kitchen. No one was there. The sound came from behind a doorway in the corner. 
He flung it open and looked down into the blackness of his cellar. He struck a light and saw a bundle lying on the ground, a bundle from which stuck out two feet that tapped at the cellar steps. He brought it up to the kitchen. It was a woman with her head and body in a sack. When he had cut her loose, he saw the dark face of the woman of the shop in the flat. She sprang at him and grasped his arm. "'Who are you?' she cried. "'Where is Lord Tetherdown?' "'My name is Fortune, madame. And yours? I am Elita Jacob. What is that to you? Where have you put Lord Tetherdown?' "'I am looking for him.' "'You? Is he not here? Oh, you shall pay for it. You are those others.' But Reggie was already running upstairs. One room and another he tried in vain, and at last at the top of the house found a locked door. The key was in the lock. Inside on a pallet bed, but clothed, lay a little man with some day's beard. The woman thrust Reggie away, and flung herself down by the bedside, and gathered the man to her bosom, moaning over him. "'My lord, my lord!' "'Oh, my aunt!' cried Reggie Fortune. "'Now, Miss Jacob, please!' He put his hand on her shoulder. "'He's mine,' she said fiercely. "'Well, just now he's mine. I'm a doctor.' "'Oh, is he not dead?' she cried. "'Not exactly,' said Rezzy Fortune. "'Not yet.' He took the body from quivering arms. "'What is it, then?' "'He is drugged, and I should say starved. If you—' A heavy footstep drew near. She sprang up, ready for battle, and in the doorway fell upon Superintendent Bell. "'Easy, easy!' He received her in his large chest and made sure of her wrists. "'Mr. Fortune, just caught in by the window. What about this?' "'It's all right,' Reggie mumbled from the bed. "'Send me Sam.' "'Coming, sir,' Sam ran in. "'Those fellows didn't do a getaway. They're ousted. Car smash. Both killed. Some smash.' "'Brandy, meat-juice, ammonia,' murmured Mr. Fortune, who was writing. "'And that. Hurry.' "'Big pot of mem.' Bell detached himself from Melita Jacob. He took off his hat and tiptoed to the bed. "'Have they done for him, sir?' he muttered. Mr. Fortune was again busy over the senseless body. One of his hands was clenched. He opened the fingers gently and drew out a greenish lump painted with a zigzag pattern in red. A magic stone, he said, a charm against death. Well, well. On his lawn, which slopes to the weir stream, Reggie Fortune lay in a deck chair, and a syringa, waxen white, shed its fragrance about him. He opened his eyes to see the jaunty form of the Honorable Sidney Lomas tripping towards him. Stout fellow, he murmured, that saw the cup. There was ice in it once, and he shut his eyes again. I infer that the patient is out of your hands. They are going to, for their honeymoon to Nigeria. Good gad, said Lomas, collecting, you see, the objects of art of the noble savage. She's rather a dear. I should have thought she'd done enough collecting. Does he understand yet what happened? Oh, he's, he's quite lucid. Seems to think it's all very natural. Does he, though? Only he's rather annoyed with Brother George. He thinks Brother George had no right to object to his marrying. That's what started it, you see. Brother George came round to borrow his usual hundred or so and found him with a magnificent militia. It occurred to Brother George that if Tetherdown is going to marry... Something had to be done about it, and then I suppose Brother George consulted the late Jordan. Mr. Fortune opened his eyes and raised himself. By the way, who was Jordan? I saw you hushed up the inquest as a motor smash. Bell thinks he was the doctor who belted out of the Anthony case. Oh, ah, yes, there was some brains in that. I rather thought the late Jordan had experience. I wonder what happened to his private patients at the ferns. Creepy house. I'll say it was Jordan or his man who threw the fit at the museum. Jordan himself, by the description. Yes, useful thing, medical training. Well, Jordan's eye could get at tether down through his obby. He came with tiles of anthropological treasures for sale. The old boy didn't bite at first. 
Jordan couldn't eat all, anything he wanted. But he found out at last what he did want. Hence the fit in the museum. That night, Jordan turned up with the Borneo stone and told Tetherdown a friend of his had some more of the kind. Tetherdown fell for that. He went off to the ferns with Jordan. The last he remembers is sitting down in the back room to look at the stone. Like chloroform, I think. There was lots of stuff in the place. Then they kept him under morphia and starved him. I suppose the notion was to dump his dead body somewhere so the fact of his death could be established and George inherit. There could be no clear evidence of murder. Tetherdown is eccentric. It would look as if he had gone off his head and wandered about till he died of exhaustion. That was the light Jordan's idea. Melita I always thought George was a bad egg. He didn't like her, you see, and he showed it. When Tetherdown vanished, she was off to George one time. He laughed at her, which was his error. She put on the nurse's rig for a disguise and watched his rooms. When I rattled him and he rang up Jordan, Jordan came to the flat and she followed him back to the ferns and asked for tether down. Jolly awkward for Jordan with me knocking at the door. He was rude though, but I don't know that I blame him. An able fellow, pity pity, yes. Why haven't you brother George? Belted, we haven't a trace of him. Which is just as well, for there's no evidence. Jordan left no papers. George could have laughed at us if he had the nerve. Reggie Fortune chuckled. I never locked George. I rang him up that night. Mr. George Coppet, the fun's speaking. It's all out. And I rang off. I thought George would quit. George will be worn quite a bit. So that's that. Yes, you have your uses, Fortune, said Lomas. I've noticed it before. Reggie Fortune fumbled in his pocket and drew out the magic stone. Tetherdown said he would like me to have it. Got him to the art to give it up, poor boy. Told me he saved his life, he smiled. I don't care for its methods myself. Better put it back in a glass case, Lomas. What did Melita give you? Melita is rather a dear, said Mr. Fortune. End of Section 6